This is Gary Stieber with a message from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Few stories permeate the entire Bible the way the story of the Tower of Babel does. We have another story that both reflects human history and forecasts the work of God all the way through to the book of Revelation. These short nine verses are connected to the entire Bible in more ways than we can imagine. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind you that if you follow the Explore the Bible study schedule, like we do, we give away our study materials free of charge. We publish every week, seven to 10 days prior to the lesson's scheduled date. And if you'd like to get the complete study notes along with the presentation to use as your needs require, click on the link in the description below and give us the email address that you'd like to have notified. Each week, we'll send you the link to the church website where you can download the materials. Now, before we begin, let's start by setting a little context, as we always do. Chapters 1 through 11 represent the first major section of the book of Genesis, what my study Bible calls the period of primeval history. The account or the generation of Terah, the father of Abram, later known as Abraham, begins at chapter 11, verse 27. And that will take us through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph to the nation of Israel. These are the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. Now, reviewing this primeval history, recall that we saw God's glorious creation where everything was very good in the right order in relation to God. And the crowning jewel of creation was mankind, who was made in his image, not in form, but in function, to be his representative here on earth. And God named the man Adam, and Adam named the woman Eve. God has the right to name his creation, and we saw Adam functioning in his role of God's representative by naming the animals and naming Eve. And then Adam and Eve were placed in the best part of the land that was very good, a garden named Eden, and everything was great. They only had one restriction, to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sometime shortly later, the Satan tricks Eve into eating from the forbidden tree. Adam follows suit, and sin enters the world, and it's all downhill from there. They're removed from the garden. Their first son, Cain, kills their second son, Seth. And then before long, mankind becomes unspeakably evil and the entire earth is polluted as a result of sin. And we saw God select Noah, the most righteous man on the planet, and his three sons and each of their wives, eight people total to carry forward. And he wipes everyone and everything else out by the flood in a giant reset and starts over. Well, things should be pretty good from there, right? These eight people survived the worst catastrophe in history, and they have enormous motivation to live in fellowship with God and ensure that their children do as well. Well, chapter 9 ends with Noah drinking to excess from his vineyard, passing out drunk and naked in his tent, and an issue arises with his youngest son, Ham, and we see that the most righteous man of his generation is still a sinner, just like you and me. At the end of the day, if you eliminate all evil and start over with the most righteous family, you still have sin. Let me ask you a question. Who's the best person that you know? Well, the best person you know is still a sinner in need of God's grace. Now, both Adam and Noah received the command to be fruitful and fill the earth. And chapter 10 describes the dispersion of the nations. We're told that the people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. That's verse 5 of chapter 10. It's the first use of the word nations in the Bible. And chapter 10 is the result of what happens in chapter 11. Chronologically, chapter 11 should be before chapter 10. In chapter 10, each nation has its own language and disperses. In chapter 11, there's still only one common language, and the people are gathered in an area not yet dispersed. Chapter 10 mentions many names and places that we're familiar with in the Bible. Cush, Egypt, and Canaan. Magog, Nimrod, and Babel. Ramah, Nineveh, and Assyria. Sidon, and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are 70 nations listed, and most of them at one time or another become an enemy to Israel. And we also see a man named Eber, the great-grandson of Shem, who was one of Noah's sons. The name Eber means the region beyond or one from beyond. And the word Hebrew comes from this name Eber. And the name Hebrew means one who passes over. And that's a sign of things to come hundreds of years still in the future. So these 70 nations spread out across the earth in chapter 10. And chapter 11 tells us how chapter 10 came about. And we have a lot to get to. So let's go. Starting at chapter 11, verse 1. 
Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. There's great emphasis on the point that there was only one language. Both the word translated as one and same is the same Hebrew word echad. And we've spoken of this word before. It means one as if there is no possibility of there being any other. Now the English language is spoken both in the United States and in Great Britain. And I had friends who traveled there some years ago who thought that they would have no trouble with the language. They had a small baby and they were traveling with a stroller, but the people they stayed with referred to it as a pram. And what one called an apartment, the other referred to as a flat. They had the same language, but they used different words. Verse 1 tells us that the earth had one language and one set of words used universally. And this makes perfect sense since mankind had a common origin in both Adam and in Noah after the reset, which is the flood. Now this is the first use of the word translated as migrated in the Bible. It's also translated as to set out or journey. And about half of the Bible versions translate this phrase as migrating from the east, the other half as migrating to the east or eastward. And while the ESV translates this as from the east, as we see here, Logo software states that the migration to the east makes more sense. In the Bible, a common theme is that good things come from the east and people moving to the east are in rebellion. Adam was removed from the garden to the east. Cain was driven from the presence of the Lord to the east. This symbolically represents a move away from God whose location was represented by the Garden of Eden. And we see the third reference in this section of the people moving away from God's presence all to the east. And we know that the use of the number three indicates a universal or infinite move. Mankind left to his own devices will continually and forever move away from God. And notice this move is voluntary and deliberate. Adam was driven away to the east and Cain and this group of people are not. The continued movement away from the presence of God is a reflection of the heart of man. The people are far away from God and their actions will demonstrate that. And one other example, notice that the Jewish people were exiled to the east. It makes more sense that this is a migration to the east than from the east. Horace Greeley is credited with saying, go west, young man. And that's more biblically aligned with good things, though that wasn't what he was talking about. Now, the land of Shinar is the land of Babylonia. The name Shinar appears in many ancient Egyptian and Hittite records, sources outside of the Bible. The meaning of the name Shinar is uncertain, but it may have to do with being sharp of mind, intellect, or wit. The outline of biblical usage defines it as the country of two rivers, which would certainly place it in Babylonia. And so the first thing we see in our story is that the people settled in Shinar. Now man was to fill the earth and be God's representative, and in order to fill the earth, someone has to settle in Shinar. So this in and of itself isn't a sign of a problem, but it's worth noticing because they are moving to the east. Verse 3, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for border. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. We see the first of three come let us statements in nine verses. The people all agree to make bricks. Let me ask you a question. What do you think of when you hear the phrase make bricks in the Bible? The primary brick making story in the Bible refers to the Hebrews in slavery in Egypt. And the people agreeing to make bricks here should raise our antennas, so to speak. The people have moved to the east and are making bricks. Those are two worrisome signs. Now, the fact that they're making bricks confirms that they're outside of the Holy Land, which, of course, hasn't yet been established and the people haven't gotten to. Israel is a very rocky place and everything in the early years was built out of stone. Here they have to make bricks because the plains of Shinar is not a rocky place. They make bricks to be used the same way stones would be used. And there's great symbolism in that. They're using a man-made item in place of a God-provided item because they have to. Now, the two words that are translated as burn thoroughly are nearly the same words. The original language says something like burn burning. It might not be apparent to us, but this is the latest technology of the day. Most bricks were simply baked in the sun. These bricks are baked in a fire. That made them more durable, 
and similar to the bricks that are made today. Now bitumen is a term for an asphalt-like material or tar, and there must have been a tar pit in the area. It's only mentioned three times in the Bible. We mentioned in our study of chapter 6 that a word used for ark is the same word used for the floating box that was built for the baby Moses in Exodus chapter 2. That box, or the basket for the baby Moses, was covered with this same material, bitumen, or tar for waterproofing. And this is another advanced building technique using bitumen for mortar. It wasn't common until the Romans many centuries later. Now let's think about that for a moment. The baking of bricks makes them waterproof, and this tower is going to have a waterproofing material interwoven through it in the mortar. Now God said in chapter 9 that he would never destroy the world again by flood. And perhaps what we see here is a statement by the people that they don't believe God, and they demonstrate that by incorporating some waterproof material into the structure that they intend to build. And in verse 4, we see the second use of the phrase, come let us. And there is strong emphasis on the let us build ourselves or let us build for ourselves. We see the intentions of the people stated as clearly as you'll ever see in the Bible. We don't have to piece together suppositions or figure out what is being said by not saying the bad part out loud. Here, the purpose statement, the bad part is said out loud. And this is meant to be their city, not God's city. It's for their purpose and glory, not God's. This is like building their own temple to themselves, so to speak. Now, this tower is to reach the heavens. The desire isn't to be nearer to God, but to rival God. And they likely understood that they couldn't actually build a tower into heaven. Some speculate that this was to be an observation tower of the heavens because we know that many astronomy and astrology practices began in the land of Babylon. Now we know that the pyramids are unique to Egypt. And in this region of Shiner, there are structures at least somewhat similar known as ziggurats. And what's being described here is more likely a very large ziggurat. And you can see a representation of what a ziggurat looks like and the location of where this ziggurat of Shiner, or Babel, is presumed to be at a YouTube video by Expedition Bible. I'll put a link in the description below. That video describes a ziggurat as having three main features. A tower that serves as the base or the foundation, a house or a temple on top, and a stairway that is the link between the two. The link between man and whatever they thought God was in the temple at the top. Now, the video that I have the link to also shows the ziggurat at Ur, which is a good link to our next story on Abram, or Abraham, who is from Ur. And note, let me say this, I find the video mentioned here really worth watching. It's about 18 minutes in length, and I think it's very well done. It'll give you a good background on what's being described here. Now, they also offer books for sale, which I have not purchased. I'm not saying buy the book, I'm not saying don't buy the book nor do I receive any compensation from the site mentioned in any way. Now, if you watch that video, recall Jacob's dream of a ladder that extends into heaven with angels ascending and descending on it. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. The next verse tells us that the Lord was at the top of the ladder, which matches John's view of a door standing open to heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, that he could see through. And the Hebrew word that's translated as ladder in the Jacob's ladder story may mean a ladder as we know it, but it may also refer to a staircase. It's an unusual word only used once in the Bible. Many commentaries connect the Tower of Babel to Jacob's dream. While Jacob saw the Lord at the top of this ladder or staircase, the people of Babel wanted that spot for themselves. And this is the point in the story where we should all say, oh no, we've seen this before. This sounds like another attempt by man to be like God. We saw that in the garden and it didn't end well there. It got the Satan kicked out of heaven, and it got Adam and Eve removed from the garden. They're saying our safety and our legacy are going to be in this tower, not in aligning ourselves with God's will, and not being aligned with God's will only leads to great problems. And notice the desire is to make a name for ourselves, and we can think of that as a reputation or a legacy. And we've said before that the concept of a name was much more important in the Bible because your name represented your whole being. And being able to name things was incredibly important. God's sovereignty was established in the naming of his creation in chapter 1. And part of being made in the image of God and being his representative was that he was given the right to name things. That was his first act of stewardship in chapter 2. And recall that God named man Adam, which we saw was a reference to the ground that he was made from. 
and it's also a picture of how much God has done for mankind, taking him from the ground to being God's representative over the entire earth. Now, people here are saying, in effect, you know what, that's not good enough. Being able to make a name for yourselves is like being able to define yourself. And it's like saying to God, we don't need your blessing. We'll go our own way. Building a tower to the heavens makes them like God, and being able to name themselves in their mind makes them God. Now, it was a common practice to inscribe the name of the king or the person overseeing the building project in the name of the baked bricks. And we see that today. When you have bricks delivered, when you're building a house, the name of the manufacturer is inscribed and baked into the bricks. Now, the case with many building projects in the ancient world was an attempt to validate a king's presence or greatness by the glory of their building project, both to the gods and to man. We see that in the pyramids, we see that in the ziggurats, and we see that here. So what we see here is pride, and oftentimes pride is demonstrated in things that we are insecure about, and that may be what we see here. Let me ask you a question. Why are the people so motivated to build a place where they can live together? Perhaps because spreading out and leaving people who are familiar can be frightening. And perhaps our greatest insecurity is in not being remembered. Recall people writing, I was here on the bathroom wall when you were a kid at school. And we see the final element of their sin in the phrase, lest we be dispersed. God's plan was that they were to be dispersed. And they say flat out, no, we're not going to do that. This is a direct attempt to thwart the plan of God. And more than making a name and a reputation for themselves, they want to make a kingdom of their own. So what we see here is how sin unfolds in the life of a person in these first few verses. It's like counting coins. You know, you have a nickel and then you have a dime and then another dime and then all of a sudden you have a dollar where the dollar represents the full-on defiance of God in sin. They're saying to God, this is our project, our city, our tower, because we don't believe you and we don't want to do what you want us to do. And you know what? We don't need you. Now that's defiance. So in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, we see everything you need to know about sin. If you want to study what the Bible teaches about sin, John describes the three types of sin as the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. All three of those are on full display in the first 11 chapters, and the results are disastrous. Eve fell because of the desires of the eyes and of the flesh. Recall that the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Now man before the flood fell because of the desires of the flesh. Recall we're told the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And here we see man is struck with the pride of life and defies God and challenges God in wanting to make a name for themselves rather than worship the name of God. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Now this is a very personal reference to the Lord. God doesn't have to come down to see it. God's presence is everywhere, and he knows everything. God said through Jeremiah, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? That's in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23. And Hannah's prayer seems to speak to the people on the plain of Shinar. She says, Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. That's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. Now, many believe the Lord coming down is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Often, when there's a physical manifestation of God, many scholars associate that with Jesus in a pre-incarnate state. And David Guzik says, we can assume this is God in the person of Jesus coming down to the plains of Shinar before his incarnation and birth at Bethlehem. Because of God the Father, it is said, no one has seen God at any time. That's recorded in John chapter 1, verse 18. And speaking of Jesus, we see the first use of an important phrase in the Bible. The word translated as children here is the Hebrew word ben, which means son. 
This is the first use of the phrase son of man in the Bible. This is literally Ben Adam in Hebrew. The sons of Adam or the sons of mankind. And Jesus, of course, referred to himself as the son of man. And here's the first use of that phrase. Now, speaking of the Lord coming down, Psalm 113, verses 5 and 6 said, Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Now, God isn't afraid that man is going to take over his position as God of the universe. If they were capable of building a tower infinitely high, if nothing else, we know that at some point elevation will become a problem and they won't be able to breathe. God has nothing to worry about on that point. But God is concerned enough about what they're doing to stop it. God is saying that if men can agree among themselves to be this prideful and sinful in pursuing their own glory, they'll do anything to destroy themselves. There would be no limit to their unrestrained rebellion. And notice that this is only the beginning of that. No sin will be impossible for them as it relates to their own ruin. And Paul said lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. That's in Romans chapter 6 verse 19. And God recognizes the potential of sinful men working together. God is saying that they can go from level 2 to level 3 to, and then to level 4 until their sin wipes them out. And God is saying that I won't let you do that. And the language is very strong here that God is concerned enough about this particular sin that he comes to earth knowing they will have begun a journey that will lead to ultimate destruction and nothing will stop them. God intervened with the flood when, speaking of man, Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We saw that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God intervenes here in a similar but different way, when nothing that man proposes to do will now be impossible for them. It's a similar condition to the thoughts of his heart in chapter 6, verse 5. We see great similarity here with the condition before the flood. Verse 7, Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. This is the third use of the phrase, come let us, but this one comes from God. And Paul Twist describes this statement as God saying, come let us deal man a gracious blow. Man will do anything to ruin himself. God's glory is not threatened by man, but he fears for their end. So he confuses their language not to protect his own glory, but to protect man. It stopped man from sinning in a multitude of ways. And we saw this same let us phrase used by God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, when God was speaking in the divine plural and perhaps to members of the divine council, and we see the same thing here. And recall that the people's desire was to build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Their desire was to go up. Here we see God going down. And God here is perhaps ridiculing the plan of the people. And notice that he isn't just confusing some words like the use of pram and carriage in the illustration before, but their entire language. Language systems are very complex. They don't have just different words, but different structures. According to Duolingo.com, all languages have dialects and accents, but they vary. All languages have rules about grammar and how words are put together, but they're not all done the same way. And all languages have ways of talking about past, presence, and future, and that can all vary. Some languages are more or less expressive than others. Now, the worst thing for us is to get away with our sins. In the movie War Room, Priscilla Schreier's character is sure her husband is doing bad things. And she prays, God, I need you. I'm not his judge. You are. I'm asking you, please, please don't let him do this. Take over. Please take over. If he's doing something wrong, don't let him get away with it. Stand in his way. I'm asking you, please, to help me. And you can see a clip of that scene in a link that I'll put below. You see, this is God stepping in the way of man and dealing a gracious blow. Man is in the process of doing something tragic, and God takes over and doesn't let them finish. Verse 8, So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now here in the United States, we all know of the history of the Western migration of groups of families in the covered wagon days. And this must have been a worldwide version of that. The first chapter of the book of Romans describes God giving up on some element of humanity. And Paul describes man by saying, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They gave up on the glory of God for other things and did not see fit to acknowledge God. So God gave them up to the lust of their heart. 
That's in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Here God steps in their way, so he doesn't completely give them over to the lust of their hearts here at Babel. And this dispersion of rebellious people may help us to understand how Israel becomes called out of the world and is to be distinct from the rest of the world in fellowship with God. Now the name Babel has two meanings. To the Babylonians, it means the gate of God. But in Hebrew, it means confusion. And one illustrates the view of man and the other the view of God. And we see another repetition of events that we saw in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story where God said to the heavenly council, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That was in chapter 1 verse 26. And then we were told in verse 27 that God created man in his own image. Here the Lord said, let us go down and there confuse their language in verse 7. But here in verse 8, we're told that the Lord confused the language of all the earth. The first statement in both cases made it sound like it's a team project. It wasn't a team project. It's all done at the hands of the Lord God. Recall the pizza example from Michael Heiser. Imagine your boss said something like, let us have pizza for lunch. And when it's time to go, your boss says, let's take my car. And you drive to the restaurant that he or she picked out. Your boss has already ordered the pizza, picked out the toppings, and paid for the meal. Let me ask you a question. Who was responsible for the lunch? Well, your boss was, even though the original language sounded like it was a group effort. What we see here is that disobedience isn't going to stop God's plan. God is either going to be for or against your actions. What God wanted them to do with a joyful heart, they ended up doing reluctantly despite their disobedience. In the end, God's plan was accomplished, but they robbed themselves of being blessed in doing it. Let me ask you a question. Why was it so important for God to disperse his people all over the earth? Well, because he is God over all of the earth. That's why in the New Testament, it's so important for the gospel to spread over the whole earth. We're to be his representatives everywhere. Psalm 55 is a prayer for God's help when Jerusalem is under attack. And the primary weapon is the mouth and the words of the opponents. They spread rumors and lies and they create mistrust. And the psalm written by David says, Destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I see violence and strife in the city. That's in Psalm 55, verse 9. David asked God to confuse the language of the enemies. And Jeremiah prophesizes against the Jews who fled Jerusalem to go to Egypt for safety in direct violation of God's warning to them not to do so. And Jeremiah said, And those who escape the sword there in Egypt shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number, and all the remnant of Judah who came to the land of Egypt to live shall know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. That's in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 28. And there in Jeremiah, as we see here, God's words will stand over man's words. Now Moses is told in Deuteronomy that the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49. That nation turns out to be Babylon. Okay, well, let's just make a couple of points here with the rest of the story. To some extent, everything done at Babel was undone at Pentecost. Peter speaks the truth of Jesus in Acts chapter 2. There are people from all over Europe, Africa, and Asia, and Luke records each one was hearing them speak in his own language. That's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 6. Each didn't hear in Greek the common language of the time, but in their own language. In Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, everyone in their own language. Now, as this story in the first section of the Bible ends, we have the sense that here we are again. Wiping out all the sinners and starting over with the most righteous family in the world has left us in the same state we were in before. Man is prideful and disrespectful towards God. Nothing has changed. Man is in desperate need of a solution to sin and pride because we can't solve that problem on our own. And with that in mind, let's make two points. First, Babel is synonymous with Babylon, and Babylon is synonymous with the Satan's capital. It's an idiom of all that is evil. David Thompson says, in the Bible, the word Babylon is used four different ways. It refers to a nation, which is in modern-day Iraq. It refers to a literal city located 55 miles south of modern-day Baghdad, the ruins of which are still visible today. It refers to a major political and commercial power that dominates God's people, headed by one leader who's in opposition to God. And we see that in the book of Revelation. And fourth, it refers to a false system of religion. 
man's organized religion as opposed to God's. And that's part of what we see here in Genesis chapter 11. Another way that we can understand that the mention of Babylon in Revelation isn't the literal city or a nation of Babylon, but the power of worldwide political and commercial systems is from the description of those who stand far off and weep when she is destroyed. All of them suffer financial loss and therefore power. The people are described of the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, and the shipmasters and the seafaring men and sailors whose trade was dependent on them. In Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, God gives a vision to the prophet of a basket that is described as going out with a woman in it and filled with all of their iniquity, and it has a heavy lid on it. Two women with wings like a stork lift the basket somewhere between the earth and the heaven and take it to the land of Shinar to build a house for it. And when it's prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. And recall that the ziggurat had three main elements, a tower that serves as the base or the foundation, a house or a temple on top of it, and a stairway. A stork is an unclean animal, so the woman with wings might represent angels or more likely some kind of demon. Perhaps the woman is wickedness personified and is similar to the great prostitute of Revelation chapter 17, who sits on top of the tower or the foundation of the house or the temple on top. If this represents the beginning of Babylon as the center of wickedness in the Bible, the removal of wickedness, well, that would be the work of God alone. The destruction of Babylon and all that it represents is described in Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, and Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And it's a good exercise to read those six chapters together. It takes about 30 or 35 minutes to do. And in that, Jeremiah tells us that the Lord God of hosts has a work to do in the land of the Babylonians. That's recorded in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25. And speaking of names, the Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. That's in chapter 50, verse 34. Why? Because her judgment has reached up to heaven and has been lifted up even to the skies. That's in 51, verse 9. You see, they wanted to build a tower into heaven, but ultimately their judgment reached into heaven. And one other interesting thing that Jeremiah tells us is that her cities have become a horror, a land of drought and a desert, a land which no one dwells. That's chapter 50, verse 43. Isaiah, on the other hand, tells us that I will make it a possession of the owls and swampland, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of hosts. That's in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 23. Now we know the land of Babylon is in the desert, but the Expedition Bible video referenced earlier shows the site where the Tower of Babel is believed to have stood is a flooded marsh. Only God could do that. Now Gary Yates describes this as having applications and implications that help us think about not just our relationship with God, but the world we live in and where humanity is headed, and finally and ultimately where history itself is heading. Babylon is the home base of both the Old Testament and Revelation for all that is in opposition to God. God declares war on both Babylon, the nation, and the gods and the systems it represents. Those are the words of Gary Yates. Jerusalem and Israel are the most important places in the Bible and God's plan. And second to Jerusalem, no place is more significant than Babylon given all that it represents in the Bible, from the Tower of Babel in Genesis to the destruction of Babylon, the great prostitute of earth's abomination in Revelation. We see that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. And Mark Hitchcock says in Revelation, one out of every 10 verses concerns Babylon. And the second thing we might note is that chapter 11 wraps up with a short account of the generations of Shem and his descendants. We get the genealogy from Shem to Abram, where chapter 12 picks up. And the name Shem means name. God is saying, you don't have to make a name for yourself. I'll give you a name. And I like the way David Guzik says it. Man didn't improve as a result of the second chance after the flood. Over time, man in the establishment of government that we spoke about last week, and along with better organization, humanity became better off, but not better. Sinners were wiped out in the flood, but not sin. No solution for sin has been put in place. Genesis chapter 12 begins the process of identifying the solution to sin in the story of Abraham. Those are the words of David Guzik. 
Chapter 12 begins with God calling Abram to go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that it will be a blessing. That's in chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. The story that follows shows the way to make a name for yourself is to follow God's call and go where he directs. God can make your name great. In fact, God renames Abram to Abraham. And that starts the progress of the nation of Israel to David and ultimately to Jesus, the Messiah. God forecasts a day in the future through the prophet Zephaniah saying, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. That's in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. The purified speech is singular. There seems to be one language to call upon the name of the Lord in the future. And he goes on to say, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. That's Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 11. We see a pattern of one language, the name of the Lord, and a high place, the holy mountain. The people of Babel were to some degree trying to do what God is going to do someday in the future. And John describes his vision in Revelation, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. You see, everything that happens in Babel is reversed at Pentecost, but God's plan is for so much more. In Revelation 18, Babylon is destroyed and the new city comes, not built by bricks by man from the ground up. It comes down from heaven. All of man's cities are going to be replaced by the city of God. This is where God's glory is found, and that translates into the goodness of man. In the meantime, Paul encourages believers by saying, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of of God. That's in Romans chapter 15 verses 5 through 7. Now let's go ahead and wrap up in summary. First, the Tower of Babel shows us something that is inside all of us. It's a monument to pride. Let me ask you a question. Are you building a tower out of your own insecurities? James, speaking of worldliness, says you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. That's in James chapter 4 verse 16. And James also said, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That's in James chapter 4, verse 10. The people of Shinar wanted to make a name for themselves and they succeeded in that, but not in the way they had hoped for. So it is with many who boast in arrogance. Second, we see that small bricks can make big walls of isolation in relationship, our marriages, among friends. When we seek our own way because we're impressed with our own cleverness, we put separation between our friends, family, and God. A little disrespect here, a little disrespect there. It's just another small brick in the process of isolating you from God and others. Third, let me ask you a question. What are you relying on to make a name for yourself? What kind of towers are you trying to make? For many today, the issue is technology. A whole generation is growing up with the desire to be an internet media influencer. Their goal is to make a lot of money filming themselves and everything they do to show the world how witty and clever they are. Every day we have to work to stifle our desire to make a name for ourselves and instead lift the name of God. Think about the Titanic, the ship that was promoted as the ship that God himself couldn't sink. Paul tells us, Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Proverbs states, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. A righteous man runs into it and is safe. That's Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. 
Psalm 9 is a great song of praise from David who sings, Those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. That's Psalm 9, verse 10. And finally, the story of the Bible isn't about man trying to build a tower to heaven using his own strength and ingenuity without God. The story of the Bible is that God came from heaven to earth, doing everything needed for man to receive heaven as a gift. Jesus on the cross brings heaven to man. God said through the prophet Isaiah, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who was of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. That's Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. You see, we don't get from earth to heaven on our own ability. We get there on his work, the work of Jesus, not ours. Back to the tower in Jacob's dream, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's in John chapter 1, verse 51. Jesus came so that we may reach heaven with him. And if you'd like to know more about putting your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you can reach out to us at the link in the description below. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. And that's the message I have for us from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And I look forward to our next time together.